world I'm in that one. Yes. Verse 35. Four. I was hungry and you fed me. Now I want you to look at the beloved right now. Because they're going, yes, we're in the kingdom. And then he says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I would have recognized that face. <laughs> Maybe it's the glowing shine and the rainbow, but I'm sure I would have picked that one out of the street. I was thirsty and you gave me something. Um, didn't you create water? Why would we, um, why would you need water? I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Amen. Now that look is like, huh? what were you doing in prison, Jesus? What did you do? Aren't you perfect? Then the righteous ones were reply, verse 37. Um, Lord, uh, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. To me. Then we'll keep, the king will turn to those on the left. The goat. Madness. Away with you, you cursed ones. Into eternal fire prepared, prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when do we ever see you? Do you see the parallel between the two groups? They both have the same question. Huh? What? When do we ever see you hungry and thirsty or strange or sick and in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. Notice that the difference between those who inherit, again, inherit eternal life and those who don't is how they invest themselves in the lives of other people. How they reach out to those who are less fortunate, who are broken, in prison, hungry, naked, hurting people. What is the experience known for? It's a rhetorical question. What is the experience known for? What are you known for? Are you known for the people that you have reached outside of your own life to help when they were hurt? Is the experience really only known for food? I don't think we're going. But it would be given that food to the people who are hurt. The people who are desperate. It's interesting to me that Christians outside of the church are known more for their stand against sex than they are for how they invest themselves in human life. We're known more for being against abortion and against homosexual marriage than we are about being against poverty or against genocide. It's homelessness. And I find it very interesting that those two hot button sex issues that we get fascinated with and scared of were both in existence in the first century and yet nowhere in the Bible does it talk about either one. Homosexuality was a part of the Roman culture. Abortion doesn't seem to be quite as big a deal because they didn't have all the techniques that we do, but they practiced infanticide. That's where a baby is born and not wanted because it's deformed or a girl or whatever, and it's placed out in the elements and left. And die. And yet nowhere in the New Testament do you hear anyone speaking out against those issues nearly as much nearly as powerful as Jesus' statement to the rich young ruler or his parable of the sheep and the goat. 
<laughs> Somehow I feel that perhaps we've got it wrong. Because the mark of the people that entered the kingdom was not their theology, their dress, it was not their stand on any political issue or their affiliation with a political party. It was how they impacted people's lives. We live in a time that we don't really know what the future holds for the next six months, the next 18 months, the next 24 months. We don't know where the economy is going, but we could be standing at one of the greatest opportunities for us to live out the gospel message that we've ever had. Because there could be a lot of people homeless and hungry. There could be a lot of people sick. There could be a lot of people who try to take things into their own hands and end up in jail trying to provide for their family. And how will we respond? Last week we uh, had a guest speaker, Carl Wilkins, talking about his experience in Rwanda during the genocide. How do we relate to people who are the least of these around the world in refugee camps, homeless? I'll tell you what he said, 9-11 for 100 days straight. Do you remember 9-11? Do you remember where you were? Do you remember how it impacted you the entire day and the weeks thereafter? Imagine that for 100 days straight. At some point, the Christian community must stand up and say, genocide must stop. This is on your table. The experience responds to genocide. Here's some simple ways that you can respond. Simple websites. Right? I'm writing to your congressman. You know, it's funny because uh, back in September, October, when uh, they started all the bailout stuff, I think it may have been for the first time in my life I wrote to my congressman. I figured that I had a lot of wisdom to fix the problems for him. I'm just sorry. In my own mind. And uh, yet I can't say that I've ever written them to say, you know what, you need to take a stand against the genocide. 